Good evening and welcome not just to one, but to two debates here at Twine Baptist Church. I'm the pastor of Twine Baptist Church, Mark Gilbert Smith, and it's a great privilege to welcome all of you here this evening. I hope as well as uh, the conversation that we'll all be part to here, there will be opportunities for conversations that will start this evening, but do be passing on cards and swapping email addresses, because I do hope that these conversations will go beyond this evening, and that as we hear one another, uh, we will grow to understand one another better and therefore to uh, have respect for one another as human beings whilst not denying the, the great differences that there are. Uh, respect involves both recognising similarities but not un, uh, underestimating differences. And uh, there are two major differences that are going to be debated tonight. In our first debate, the question will be uh, proposed by Dr. James White. Was the New Testament reliably transmitted from its authors. And in the second debate, the question will be proposed uh, from Adnan Rashid, was the Quran reliably transmitted from the Prophet Muhammad? We have quite a long evening ahead of us. Each debate will have 25 minutes each for proposers, 10 minutes each for answering statements, and then a 10 minute back and forth, and then five minutes each for closing statements, which is a, a full 90 minutes for each debate. Um, and we are going to take but 10 minutes at 9 o'clock between the two debates. Uh, there will be some refreshments served, uh, so do please go through uh, into the hall to my left for some refreshments, and if you uh, need to use the ablutionaries, then they are uh, to my right uh, at the back there. So please do uh, recognise we're not going to get all of that done in 10 minutes so let's just try and come in and out quietly if we're going into the second de debate as we're coming in from that. Let me just uh, introduce the two debaters this evening. On my right is Adnan Rashid, a historian with a speciality in the history of Islamic civilization, comparative religion, and hadith literature. He has an honors degree in history from the University of London and is currently pursuing further studies. He's also gained ijazas in hadith from a number of scholars. He also takes a keen interest in Islamic uh, numismatics, is that right? Numismatics, thank you, and ancient manuscripts. He has debated many high profile figures, figures in the field of politics, history, and Christian Islamic theology. And uh, on my left is uh, James White. Dr. James White is the director of the Alpha and Omega Ministries uh, based in Phoenix, Arizona. It's a, a, an apologetic ministry. He received a uh, Bachelor of Arts from Gan Grand Canyon College. Was it hard to study without just looking out of the window at Grand Canyon College? It was about 350 miles. Okay, it's pretty easy then. <laughs> um, an MA from Fuller Theological Seminary, and a THM and THD and DMIN from Columbia Evangelical Seminary, an unaccredited distance learning school. He has served as a professor of Greek, Hebrew, systematic theology, and various apologetic to uh, topics at the Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary, uh, its extension campus in Arizona, and in the Columbia Evangelical Seminary. He's also a critical consultant for the Lockman Foundation's New American Standard Bible. It's a great privilege to have both of you here. Uh, I'm going to be quiet quite soon, uh, just to say that when I've sat down, Dr. James White is going to begin with his 25-minute statement. Well, good evening to you. Thank you for being here this evening. Uh, I want this evening to be a night of education for all of us. My goal this evening is not so much, quote unquote, winning a debate, as it is making sure that everyone in this room, when you leave, has at least the beginning of a sound understanding of what the issues are that we need to deal with to honestly, accurately, and fairly analyze the means by which each one of us has come to be in possession of the scriptures that we call the Word of God. And that is a fundamental issue between us. If we are going to have a conversation about the gospel, about what we believe, about what it means to worship God, how many times in these debates that we've done does it all come back to, well, what really is the Word of God? And so this evening, that is my goal. My goal this evening is to make sure that there is clarity on the part of everyone here, as far as is possible, and it relies upon me on these particular issues. Now, 
Few today understand the history of ancient documents, how they came to be in our possession. The process of transmission in antiquity is vast differently, vastly differently than how uh, works are transmitted today. I mean, you can write a book today and have it on people's uh, Kindles and computers all across the world in a matter of hours. That's pretty new in human experience, let me put it that way. Hand copying was the only way to produce documents for distribution until relatively recent times, the vast majority of human history, that is how written documents were transmitted. Now, every document produced prior to printing and even after printing, printing is not a flawless process, has been corrupted in its transmission. What does corruption mean? Well, in scholarly use, corruption is any variation or alteration in the text, no matter how minor it might be. So when the King James Version of the Bible was first printed, there were certain mistakes. For example, in the commandment in one edition, thou shalt not commit adultery, the pr printer forgot the word not. Uh, now that was a pretty major problem. Uh, that was a corruption in the transmission, but it wasn't exactly something that would cause you to wonder what the Bible was actually saying. It was obviously a printer error. But corruption means any variation whatsoever or alteration in the text, no matter how minor it might be. Now this evening, in the first debate, we're talking about the New Testament. There are over 5,700 cataloged Greek manuscripts in the New Testament comprising ancient papyri containing only a few lines of a text to complete manuscripts from as late as the 15th century. Now, including ancient translations such as Latin, Coptic, etc., there are more than 24,000 manuscripts that have been uh, cataloged in regards to the text of the New Testament in a handwritten form. Now, you need to understand, no ancient work comes close to the New Testament with reference to the number of witnesses and the number of early witnesses that it possesses. And by the way, the Quran is not considered to be an ancient text, it's a medieval text. And so it's not in the comparison with the New Testament because it comes 700 years later at a much uh, uh, closer time period to us. So for example, in this graphic, you can see here, if, if, if this is the origin of a book, this is the number of years out till we have the first witnesses out here. And then the, the size of the, of the circle indicates how many witnesses we have. So, for example, Homer here. Homer comes uh, about the earliest witnesses we have are 500 years after it's written. We have about 643 manuscripts. Uh, poor Thucydides out here. Uh, he's, he's all the way out at 1,300 years before we have the first copy of it. We only have eight manuscripts of it. So you can see that works written at the time of the New Testament uh, very few manuscripts and they come long after. This big huge thing is not the sun. <laughs> That's the New Testament. And it comes that close to the time of its original writing. You have about 24,000 manuscripts in Greek and other translations. In comparison to any other contemporary work, any work of antiquity, the New Testament is by far the earliest attested and best attested document of antiquity. Now, the problem is, the more manuscripts witnesses that we, one has, the more variants one will have. If you only have one witness, if you only have one text, you will have no textual variants. But you will likewise have little basis upon which to believe that you have the original text. If you only have one copy, are you sure that one copyist got everything right? What if he messed up? What if he, uh, uh, what if he actually wanted to change the text? If we don't have anything to compare it to, we'd have no way of knowing. The more witnesses you have, the confidence you have that you possess the original text increases. So, more witnesses, more confidence, more witnesses, more textual variants that you have to examine. You need to keep that in mind when we consider the history of the New Testament text. Now, taking the most liberal estimate, we have about 400,000 variants in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. However, 99% of these variations cannot be translated out of Greek. That is, they do not impact the meaning of the text. For example, there is something in Greek called the movable new. In English, you're supposed to say an apple or a bat. You're supposed to put that n in there so it's easier to pronounce. Greek had something similar to that, the movable new. Eh, later copyists just didn't get that rule very well, sort of like people from the south in my country. And uh, so very often they, they would skip it or they would put it someplace where it wasn't supposed to be. But every time one little manuscript has an extra little new in it, that's a variant. So 99% of the variants uh, simply do not impact the meaning of the text whatsoever. 
Of the remaining variants, the vast majority are simple errors of sight or hearing, depending on how the manuscript was produced, if it was produced by a person copying another manuscript, or in a scriptorium where someone's reading the manuscript and other people are writing it down. You get more manuscripts done that way, but then you introduce uh, errors of hearing at that point. One particularly common error was homoiteluton, and that is similar endings. It's similar to when we were in school and we were, we were copying out something uh, from a book, we were writing a, a report, and uh, you see a word that ends in ing in English, or t-i-o-n, and so you type that out and you look back and your eyes catch a t-i-o-n and you continue on, except it was on the line below where you, were, where, where you just were. That kind of seeing similar endings and accidentally skipping stuff as a result, very, very common for us today, and of course it happened in the copying of New Testament texts and any ancient text as well. For example, here's an example from 1 John 3.1, Clethomen chi esmen, you see that mu epsilon nu right here is in red, if you can sort of see that. And there is a variant in the New Testament where certain manuscripts don't have this phrase, and we are. Well, it's pretty obvious that it came from Homo Eteliotan. Since we have so many manuscripts, we're able to recognize that, and that is a part of the practice of textual criticism. These kinds of scribal errors are common and expected in any widely transmitted document. The only place you're not going to get them is if you chisel your book on a rock. Uh, but that's sort of hard to carry around, very difficult to distribute, and you have to ask everybody to come read your rock, and it just doesn't really work well if you're trying to present a gospel all across the world. Now, as long as one has a robust manuscript tradition representing various geographical areas and containing early witnesses, these kinds of variations are rather easily detected. But, of, but all of these considerations relate primarily to a freely transmitted text, not to a controlled, edited, or redacted text. This is the key issue this evening. Please listen to me at this point so you can understand the conversation tonight. A freely transmitted text is one whose transmission is not controlled by an external authority, such as a government. It is widely copied without constraint. A controlled text is one that is copied under the guidance of an external authority. A freely transmitted text will have more textual variants, but will have greater confidence as to originality. A controlled text will have more uniformity, but much less confidence as to originality. Now, why would that be? Because if you have a bunch of witnesses coming from a wide variety of sources, all saying the same thing about your text, then you have great confidence that that's the original text. But if you only have one text coming from a group of people that get to control the text, what if they decide to change it and then destroy what they had before? Uh, I mean, for example, I would not want a U.S. government-produced Bible. I really don't know that I would, I would trust the, any government, for that matter, but I live in the U.S., so a U.S.-produced Bible. Uh, I want a freely produced one. Thank you very much. Uh, it would increase my confidence in its originality. A freely transmitted text can promise to present the original readings in its manuscript tradition. A controlled text cannot promise the original text past the last redaction or revision, especially if previous versions are destroyed. That's very, very important. In a freely transmitted text, the original readings will still be able to be found in the manuscript tradition, even when people, even when a copyist has a bad day, his isn't the only copy. You'll be able to find the original reading in the entire manuscript tradition. But if you are redacting your text, editing your text, you come up with official text and then you destroy everything else, you can't go back to the original anymore. You've got to believe the people making that redaction got it absolutely right. That's the difference between a freely transmitted text and a controlled text. Now, the New Testament was a freely transmitted text. The initial gospels and epistles of the New Testament were written at various places at various times. Some were written for distribution within the community, such as the gospels, and then it just simply disappears. I'm not sure where that went. Did someone, uh, someone just hacked into my Mac, I'm sure. Anyways. Uh, some were written for distribution within the community, such as the Gospels. Others were epistles sent to very specific locations. Then copies were made and sent elsewhere. Often Christians traveling from one place to another would encounter a book they had not heard of before and hence would make a copy to bring back to their own fellowship. 
And though a graphic that would represent how many different lines of transmission there were and how often they were interconnected would rapidly become useless due to the number of manuscripts that would be on the screen, the fact of that complex history of transmission should be kept in mind. Over time, single books would be gathered into collections. This is especially true of the Gospels and the Epistles of Paul. Hence, we have P75 and P66, which are gospel collections from around 175 to 200. P46, containing the epistles of Paul, all dating from the middle to the end of the second century. These collections would then come together until finally, after the peace of the church in 313, you could have entire copies of the scriptures, such as we find in Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. But the important point to note is the multifocality of this process. Multiple authors writing at multiple times to multiple audiences produced a text that appears in history already displaying multiple lines of transmission. This results in the textual variance we must study, but it also illustrates in something else that is very important. It truly is something we need to recognize that the transmission of the text of the New Testament did not follow a single line of transmission. The New Testament originated in multiple places, was written by multiple authors, with books being sent to multiple locations. This means the text was never under the control of a single individual or group. At no time in its history, at the time of authorship or any point during its time of transmission, were the New Testament documents under the control of an individual or group. This is vitally important. When people tell you that entire doctrines were taken out or inserted in the New Testament, it is impossible. There was never a time when the New Testament was in a situation where any individual or group of people could make that kind of change. If anyone did try to gather up all the manuscripts they could find and make wholesale changes in them, there were already manuscripts buried in the sands of Egypt. And so once they were dug up, you would see the vast differences between the altered texts and the texts that they could not get their hands on. And so there was simply was never a time when the New Testament could undergo that kind of textual corruption. As a result, we can look forward to finding even earlier manuscripts in New Testament documents as the free transmission of the text has provided us with a solid basis for asserting that we continue to possess the original readings of the authors themselves. In fact, we're looking forward to a book coming out in February of next year. It's been announced that there's been a new papyri find. And in fact, the argument of the book, and no one's been able to check it out yet, but some very trustworthy scholars have said that the argument of the book is they have found papyri now that go back to the first century for the Gospel of Mark. These would be the earliest manuscripts that we have of the New Testament and a great increase of second century manuscripts, which again would only make the New Testament exceed even farther any work of antiquity in the testimony that we have for its uh, reliability. This is a quote. It says, the transmission of the New Testament textual tradition is characterized by an extremely impressive degree of tenacity. Once a reading occurs, it will persist with obstinacy. It is precisely the overwhelming, ma overwhelming mass of the New Testament textual tradition, assuming the Hugaianusa didascalia of New Testament textual criticism, which provides an assurance of certainty in establishing the original text. We can be certain that among the New Testament manuscripts, there is still a group of witnesses which preserves the original form of the text despite the pervasive authority of ecclesiastical tradition and the prestige of the later text. That, those are the words of Kurt and Barbara Olland in their book, The Text of the New Testament, pages 291 through 292. The Ollands, of course, recognized as some of the greatest experts in the subject of New Testament textual criticism in the world before his passing anyways. And they, of course, set up the, uh, the New Testament Center in Munster, where all the New Testament manuscripts are cataloged today. Now, one of the reasons I asked uh, that we get together this evening is because I listened to uh, a debate between Adnan and uh, Jay Smith, which was at Trinity College in Dublin, I believe, wasn't it? Uh, and uh, uh, Adnan made a number of statements in that particular debate that I have a feeling we might be hearing again this evening. In a debate at Trinity College, Adnan said, can we trust the gospel records? I believe that we don't even have what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Paul even wrote, let alone what God might have revealed to them. He also said there are more variant readings in the New Testament than there are words. We do not have two similar manuscripts of the New Testament in their contents. And it is impossible to know today what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Paul might have written. 
Now, I would call that a position of radical st uh, skepticism. These statements represent skepticism beyond that even of unbelieving scholars, like Bart Ehrman. The picture of the New Testament that was given to that audience that night is never presented by anyone who has done first-hand study of the New Testament documents. For example, here on the screen, I asked my computer to compare the two most dissimilar printed editions of the Greek New Testament. For those of you who know anything about New Testament textual criticism, this is a comparison of the Alexandrian text with the Byzantine text. These are the two edges of the spectrum. And it might be a little bit difficult to see, but actually I think it's pretty clear. There are, this is Hebrews chapter 6, verses 8 through 20. There are exactly three places, right there, right there, and right there, marked in green, where the most dissimilar printed editions of the Greek New Testament vary from one another. That doesn't mean that it's difficult to determine what the original reading was there. But look at how much of the text, there is absolutely no variation whatsoever. None. When we hear about the idea that, well, there's, there's more variations than there are words in the New Testament. Well, let's say there are 400,000 variations, and there happen to be 138,162 words in the Nestle Island 27th edition of the Greek New Testament. So here's a graphic. And uh, so this, the red, would be the, the total number of variants, and the blue would be the total number of words. And people hear that and they go, that's like three possibilities for every word. No, it's not. That's not what that means in any way, shape, or form. Uh, let's, let's keep a few things in mind as we think about this. As I said, 99% of all variants do not impact the meaning of the text. Variations in spelling and word order make up the vast bulk of the variations. Hence, 1% of 400,000 is 4,000 meaningful textual variants. Out of 138,162 words is 2.9%, or one meaningful variant every three pages. But only half of these are viable. That means that the only half of them have an opportunity of actually having been the original readings. So there are about 1,500 to 2,000 viable, meaningful New, Te New Testament textual variants. That's quite a different picture. In fact, if we were to look at the graphic with, the, with, the, uh, with that in mind, now the blue is the number of words, and that little red line over there is the number of meaningful variants in comparison to the number of words. And so think about it with me for just a moment. 1,500 to 2,000 meaningful and viable variants over 2 million pages of hand-copied text spanning approximately 1,500 years prior to the invention of printing is an amazingly small percentage of the text reflecting an amazingly accurate history of transmission. One might well say it is completely miraculous in what you have there. Now, what then do we need to be thinking about this evening? Three things. Free transmission of the text versus controlled transmission. The free transmission of the New Testament, Christian believers want everybody to know the gospel. And so they put their text out. And remember, for the first 250 years of Christian history, the Christian people are persecuted. And eventually, very early on in history, the Romans outlaw the Christian scriptures as well. And so we have evidence of literally thousands of manuscripts being destroyed by the Romans. Now that's going to be different than the destroying of manuscripts that we're going to see in regards to the history of the Quran. Because the destruction of New Testament manuscripts wasn't of a certain text type. The Roman soldier didn't know what he was destroying. He could care less. In fact, some Christians fooled Roman soldiers by giving them secular books, which they couldn't tell from being Christian books. And they got away with it. Thousands of manuscripts destroyed. So Christians are having to produce a lot of manuscripts. There's a lot of copying going on because Christians love their scriptures and they want other people to have the message of Jesus. And so you have this wide transmission and it's going on in France and it's going on in Spain and Italy and Asia Minor and Caesarea and it's going on in Egypt and it's going on in North Africa and it's going on all over the place. And at no time does anyone have control over that text. The result is only 1,500 to 2,000 meaningful variants that we really have to do some work on. And remember, the original is still there. Our job is to examine the manuscripts and find out which one the original is. The original is still there. Nothing's disappeared. 
In fact, later manuscripts tend to be a little bit longer because scribes tended to expand names of deity. So if, uh, if in the earlier manuscripts you had Jesus, uh, later scribes tended to put the Lord Jesus. Or if it was Lord Jesus in the original, then it became Lord Jesus Christ. They tend to be a little bit longer. As, as a friend of mine has put it, this, this uh, really good way of putting it, in dealing with the New Testament text, because we have such a rich amount of manuscripts, basically what you're dealing with is a jigsaw puzzle with, with uh, a thousand piece, with, it's a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle, but we have a thousand and ten pieces. It's not that there's something missing. It's not like one of those horrible situations you get to the end and there's a hole in it because the cat ate one of the pieces and you, you didn't realize that it happened. That's not what we have with the New Testament. Instead, the issue is what was added later on in the, in the sense of a word or a phrase, nothing more than that. That is, in reality, the best way to transmit a document from antiquity. The best way. The only other more accurate way is to chisel it on a rock someplace. Then you've got to hope there's not an earthquake, uh, or you've got to hope that it doesn't get weathered and worn away, or vandals don't come along and destroy it. There are other ways that that can be destroyed. The best way to get a message out was the way the New Testament was transmitted. The result was you had people who weren't professional scribes who made copies. Their handwriting may not have been so good, so people made a mistake copying what they wrote. Okay, we can deal with that. And we're wide open about that. You can go online today. The Nessie Allen 28th edition is, is going online. You can look at every variant there is. Christians are wide open with their text. Versus controlled transmission. What if someone had come along and gathered up all the New Testament manuscripts? Couldn't do it. But what if it had happened? And then they put out the official version. And then they destroyed everything before that. Now you can't get past that point. Now you have to trust the person who made that redaction, that revision, got it absolutely perfectly right. That's controlled transmission. The multifocality of the New Testament, multiple authors, various times, different audiences, means again, there could not have been any type of controlling authority. And then the tenacity of the text. The original readings are still there. When I debated Bart Ehrman on this subject, I asked him to give me one place, one place in all the New Testament. Here is the, the biggest critic of the New Testament in the world today. Bart Ehrman, show me one place where you believe that the original reading of the New Testament is no longer found in the New Testament manuscripts. Boy, you would think he'd have hundreds of them, right? No. He had one. And it was the difference between Enochai and Enoch in Peter. And there's not a single manuscript that supports his conjectural emendation at that place. That's all he had. One. And it had nothing to do with anything. It had nothing to do with God or Jesus or anything else. Because, you see, Bart Ehrman recognizes. He's even said, New Testament textual criticism today, all we're doing is we're tinkering. We're playing around. We know what it said. We know what it said. And you see, his problem is he doesn't believe that God still speaks. And I hope there's nobody in this room tonight that would agree with him on that, no matter what your position is. So there you have what we're dealing with this evening. What we're going to need to do in the second debate is apply the same standards to the Quran that we did in the New Testament. We, what you need to do, your role tonight, hold the two of us to the same standard. The Quran even says, use equal weights, right? On the scales, we need to do the same thing in a debate. That's how we honor the truth. That's how we honor our scriptures. That's how we honor one another. Thank you very much for your attention. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Amma ba'd, all praises are due to God, Allah, the God of Moses, the God of Abraham, the God of Jesus, and the God of Muhammad. God told us in the Quran in chapter 2, verse 79, that woe be unto those who write books with their own hands and say these books are from God. This is exactly what I'm going to discuss today. James has effectively argued my case for me. Thank you very much. As we will see in due course, he has actually confirmed what I'm going to argue, that the New Testament was indeed not transmitted reliably. 
from its authors. I will quickly address some of his uh, contentions he raised in his opening statement. He stated that the New Testament is by far the best attested document from antiquity, which is true. But what he didn't tell you was that most of these testimonies and attestations come from the 9th century onward. 94% of the New Testament manuscripts in the Greek language come from the 8th century onwards, even after the Quran. So there are only few manuscripts from the early centuries of the New Testament which do confirm what may be in the New Testament. 99% of these variant readings make no difference to the meaning. That's not what we're deba debating today. The debate today is whether the New Testament was corrupted or not. That's the question. And if it was corrupted, then it was not reliably transmitted from its alleged authors. Free transmitted text equals more confidence. That was one of the biggest blunders I've heard in my life. I don't understand how that can be true. How can be free transmission of a text which was written by someone in the past uh, and copied by hundreds and thousands of people be authentically, um, can be attributed to the original authors? This does not make sense to me at all. So if thousands of people are copying a document which was written in the first century by someone and all of these thousands of people are adding their own view on the verses or their own words or their own expressions or their own uh, glosses on the text. How do we know what was originally written by those people who wrote in the first century? So in my view, free transmission means less confidence and controlled transmission by those who wrote the text means more confidence. So imagine if Mark himself was the manager of copying of these manuscripts. If John himself was responsible for dictating the Gospel of John to the scribes, this is what you call controlled transmission. And then he made sure that these copies were transmitted to the other copies reliably. He left instructions, he told them how to copy, how to read, how to recite. This is what you call controlled transmission done by the person who is responsible for writing the text in the first place. And this means more confidence, not what James White uh, claims today. Multifocality. James has a theory called multifocality. Different authors writing different books, different documents in different places, and that means a good thing. No, that doesn't mean a good thing. That means a big problem. How do we know that? How do we know who wrote the Gospels in the first place? Where did they write them? When did they write them? In what language were these documents written? Multifocality comes with its own problems. You will have to show us how multifocality is a good thing or is an argument in your favor because with multifocality come big problems. I will move on to my presentation. Now, first of all, James did not tell us as to what New Testament is. What is the New Testament? What does it mean? What is the document called the New Testament? Who decides what it is? Is there unity on uh, the New Testament today? There are so many New Testaments today. To mention few, we have the Ethiopian New Testament, which is different to what James reads. We have uh, the Syriac New Testament, which is still followed by some of the Christians in South India, which differs to what James uh, reads today. We have the Protestant New Testament today and the Catholic New Testament, which is exactly the same uh, as what James uh, reads as the New Testament. Then, in the early church, we had many differences among the church fathers. First of all, the earliest church fathers never referred to the books of the New Testament as scripture. The New Testament did not exist in its current form until the mid-third century. The first person to mention the four Gospels together in one place was Irenaeus, who was an early church father who lived about the year 200 CE when he was writing. He is the first person, pay attention please, he is the first person to mention the four Gospels together. The New Testament was 
constructed carefully in the first three Christian centuries. So Clement of Rome does not refer to the New Testament as scripture. Ignatius of Antioch does not refer to the New Testament as scripture. Papias of Hierapolis does not mention the New Testament as scripture. Barnabas does not refer to the New Testament or any of the books of the New Testament as scripture. Polycarp does not refer to the books of the New Testament and Hermas of Rome, the same thing. These people, when they refer to the writings of the New Testament, they would call them memoirs of the apostles, period. They wouldn't say these were inspired words of God or these books were inspired by God and Matthew, Mark, Luke and John were inspired authors. They never claimed this themselves. And another question is, who are these people? How do we know who they are, where they lived, and what they wrote? We will see in due course what I mean by that. Then the later church fathers who did refer to the New Testament, or some of the books of the New Testament as scripture, they differed in their canon. Their lists of books differed uh, with each other or from each other. Irenaeus omits, for example, 2 and 3 John. He omits James, Jude, 2 Peter, Acts, and contains on top of that an apocryphal book called The Shepherd of Hermas. Then we move on, Clement of Alexandria omits 1, 2, 3 John, 1 and 2 Peter, Revelation, and James, and contains on top of that Barnabas and Apocalypse of Peter. Origin omits James, Jude, and Acts. Now, how do we know these people who wrote these books in the first century or in the second century, allegedly, as the Christians claim, were actually writing, uh, defending God or on behalf of God. They never claimed to be inspired. They never said that I am writing because God told me to write. That's not true. And that cannot be substantiated. In fact, the canon of the New Testament was not agreed upon until the Reformation. Now, Lee Martin MacDonald, in his book, The Biblical Canon, Page 383, he states, only during the Reformation did the Catholics achieve unity on the New Testament canon with the decree by the Council of Trent. But by that time, Luther had already denied full canonical status of James, Hebrews, Jude, and Revelation. Here, here we were being told by one of the authorities in the field, in the Biblical canon, that as late as the 16th century, Martin Luther was questioning the validity of some of the books of the New Testament. So to this day, the Christians don't have a document called the New Testament in the sense that they're not united upon it. To this day, people who refer to themselves as Christians don't have a united document called the New Testament. So you have to define what you mean by the New Testament. Who are the authors of these gospels and epistles? This is another question I wish to address. Now, James is aware of these disputes. I'll give you a few examples. Second Peter is one of the most highly contested books in the New Testament. Some of the early church fathers didn't even consider it to be canonical, and they considered it to be a forgery. The Gospel of John had a very controversial status in the early church. Some of the early Christian church fathers believed that it is a heretical gospel because a lot of the heretics were actually referring to, his, uh, referring to this gospel as uh, canonical and as authoritative. And then the debate about its author. If we don't know who the author is, how do we know what he wrote? And if we don't know what he wrote, how can we even claim to have the original? What does having original mean? When you say we have the original, we can reconstruct, reconstruct the original, what do you mean by the original? Where is it? We cannot see it. All the original documents, manuscripts, have been lost. We do not have one original copy written, written by any of the New Testament authors. Not one. Not even one copy. And the earliest we have is P52, a small fragment as big as a credit card, uh, which has the Gospel of John, chapter 18, some parts of it. It's a small fragment from the year 125, if we were to be generous with dating. And then the first complete copy of the New Testament we find is in the fourth century, mid fourth century. Almost, almost, 250 years away from the authors who originally are thought to be the authors of the New Testament. So who are these authors? Who is John? 
There is a dispute about the Gospel of John as to who wrote the Gospel. Was it the John, the son of Zebedee? Was it the John of Ephesus? Or was it the John, the presbyter? Who, which, when, how, where? These are the questions the Christians are still debating. So how do we know that John even wrote the Gospel? And if we don't know who wrote the gospel, if we are not certain about that, how do we know what he wrote? And if we don't know, if we cannot be certain as to what he wrote, how can we even contemplate or conceive or even imagine an original? This is the question I ask. So the earliest manuscripts are from, for example, P45 is the earliest manuscript of the Gospel of Mark, which is thought to be the earliest gospel, the first gospel ever written. And the first manuscript of this particular gospel is from the year 220, again, if we were to be generous with dating, 220 CE. Mark is thought to have been written in the year 60, somewhere between 60 to 70. So we have a difference, a distance of 150 years between the first copy and the alleged author. Then P46, 2 Corinthians, written by Paul allegedly, dates the first manuscript we have is from the year 200 CE. Then we have P52, which I've already discussed. So now, what do these variant me readings mean? Why were these texts copied by thousands of people? And how did so many corruptions, so many differences, so many variants actually came in? This is the question I like to address. If, first of all, if we don't know who the, who, the, who the authors are and what they wrote and where the originals are, how can we even imagine an original? If we don't know what an original looks like, how can we imagine trying to reconstruct that original if we don't know what it looks like? Because all scholars, almost all scholars are unanimous on this point that majority of the corruptions made in the biblical, the New Testament, Manuscripts were made before the year 200, before the earliest manuscripts we have. So if that is the case, when all the differences were made then, all the additions and corruptions and subtractions were made then, how do we know what we are looking for in these manuscripts? So what do these manuscripts actually mean? And what do these variant readings mean for Christians? So the problem is, according to Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible, the New Testament is now known, whole, or in part, in nearly 5,000 Greek manuscripts alone. Every one of these handwritten copies differ from every other one. In addition to these Greek manuscripts, the New Testament has been preserved in more than 10,000 manuscripts of the early versions and in thousands of quotations of the Church Fathers. These manuscripts of the versions and quotations of the Church Fathers differ from one another just as widely as do the Greek manuscripts do. Only a fraction of this great mass of material has been fully collect, uh, collated and carefully studied. Until this task is completed, the uncertainty regarding the text of the New Testament will remain. This is a Christian source, by the way, compiled by a number of Christian scholars. And I continue. It has been estimated that these manuscripts and quotations differ among themselves between 150,000 and 250,000 times. This number has increased, by the way, to 400,000 times, according to the, the, the most recent estimates. And I continue. The actual figure is perhaps much higher. A study of 150 Greek manuscripts of the Gospel of Luke has revealed more than 30,000 different readings. The question is, which one was written by Luke? Luke couldn't have possibly written these 30,000 different readings. The point here is that Luke was definitely not reliably transmitted. And this is exactly what the problem is with every single New Testament document. All of them have these thousands of differences and variant readings, whether in wording or meaning. It is true, of course, that the addition of the readings from another 150 manuscripts of Luke would not add another 30,000 readings to the list. But each manuscript study does add substantially to the list of variants. It is safe to say, pay attention please, it is safe to say that there, are, there is not one sentence in the New Testament in which the manuscript tradition is wholly uniform. Many thousands of these different readings are variants in orthography or grammar or style 
and however effect upon meaning of the text. But there are many thousands which have a definite effect upon the meaning of the text. It is true that not one of these variant readings affects the substance of Christian dogma. It is equally true that many of them do have theological significance and were introduced into the text intentionally. It may not affect the substance of Christian dogma to accept the reading Jacob, the father of Joseph, and Joseph, to whom the virginity Mary was, uh, uh, to whom Mary was uh, um, betrothed, the father of Jesus, who is called Christ, as does the Sinaitic uh, Syriac, but it gives rise to a theological problem. It has been said that the great majority of the variant readings in the text of the New Testament arose before the books of the New Testament were canonized, and that after those books were canonized, they were very carefully copied because they were scripture. This, however, is far from being the case. It is true, of course, that many variants arose in the very earliest period. There is no reason to suppose that the first person who ever made a copy of the autograph of the Gospel of Luke did not change his copy to conform to the particular tradition with which he was familiar, but he was under the compulsion to do so. Once the Gospel of Luke had become scripture, however, the picture was changed completely. The copyist was under compulsion to change his copy to correct it because it was scripture, it had to be right. The Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible, volume four, page 594 to 595. This is the reality. This is what multifocality and free transmission does to you. James is a prolific, pro prolific speaker. He has amazing speaking skills, much better than I can ever imagine to be. And he is employing his speaking skills to suppress a big problem, a big problem within the manuscripts. Flashy terms, beautifully sounding words are not going to change the problem. The problem is that these variants do affect the meaning, in some cases, significantly. So what does Bruce Metzger has to uh, tell us? What does he have to tell us? Bruce Metzger is a believing Christian. Before I mention Ehrman, because Ehrman, Bart Ehrman is an apostate and James White has debated him. How much time do I have? Because I'm not timing myself. Thank you, thank you. So Bart Ehrman is an apostate from Christianity. He was a Christian, so he claims. In the beginning, when he studied the manuscripts, he apostatized because he saw so many variant readings and he came to realize that this cannot possibly be the word of God. Why would God reveal something, inspire something to people and then change it or, or let it be changed to such an extent that we have simply lost the original meaning and what was written by those people. Now how do the Christians reconstruct the Bible? How do they attempt to reach at an original reading what is the process? Who decides what goes in the Bible you read today in your churches in English language? Who decides? Does it come from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul? Is that true? Absolutely not. They have nothing to do with the Bible you read today in your churches. Why do I say that? Because the people who prepare this Bible for you have this to say. Bruce Metzger is one of the leading members of one of these committees which constructed the Greek New Testament, including this one in front of me, the fourth edition of the Greek New Testament, he stated in his book, a textual commentary on the Greek New Testament, second edition, page 11 of the introduction. He states, of the approximately 5,000 Greek manuscripts of all or part of the New Testament that are known today, no two agree exactly in all particulars. Confronted by a mass of conflicting readings, Editors must decide which variants deserve to be included in the text and which should be relegated to the apparatus. Although at first it may seem to be a hopeless task amid so many thousands of variant readings to sort out those that should be regarded as original, that should be regarded as original. Textual scholars have developed certainly generally acknowledged criteria of evaluation. The, these cons considerations depend, it will be seen, upon probabilities not certainties, probabilities. And sometimes the textual critics must weigh one set of probabilities against another.
The range and complexity of textual data are so great that no neatly arranged and mechanically contrived set of rules can be applied with mathematical precision. Each and every variant reading needs to be considered in itself and not judged merely according to a rule of thumb. Effectively, what Bruce Metzger is telling you here is that editors decide as to what goes in this Bible you read in English language, which is later on translated from Greek to English. Editors must decide. The question is, who gives this authority to these editors to tell you as to what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John may have written? This in itself is clear indication that we have simply lost what was written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the scholars now have to apply set of probabilities against other set of probabilities to construct the original text. How can someone in the 21st century and the 20th century construct a text which was written by allegedly someone in the first century? And even especially when you don't have the original copies. You don't even know what the original looked like. You don't even know who wrote it, where, when, how. We to this day have debates ensuing about the, the language of the Gospel of Matthew. The earliest testimony we have is from uh, Papias from the early second century, and he stated Matthew was originally written in the Hebrew language. If that's true, and that's more devastating than any other claim I'm going to make, if that's true, the earliest copy of Matthew we have is in the Greek, in the Greek language. So where is the original Hebrew language? If we were to think about a book being transfer, transferred in its entirety to another language, are we not going to lose the meaning? Are we not going to lose the expression? Are we not going to lose the actual words written by Matthew if he, in fact, wrote in Hebrew? Yes, we will. Definitely, we will. I move on. Now, there are many internal problems to suggest that the Gospel of John in its current form was written at least by two people. Scholars are almost unanimous on that point. Scholars, not fundamentalists. I'm talking about scholars here people who are serious about these studies. And I will apply the same criteria to the Quran, if the Quran shares any history with the New Testament, which is not the case, but we will try our best to apply the same criteria to the Quran, because the Quran has a distinct history. It's a different document altogether. It doesn't have the history the New Testament has. So now, the Gospel of John is thought to have been written by at least two hands, because the chapter 21, assumes another author of that particular chapter, at least. And even the prologue, the most important part, according to some Christians, where the Gospel of John clearly states, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word itself became God. This passage is thought to be a later edition by a redactor. Thank you. By a redactor, someone who edited the Gospel of John, and is in its current form, it is thought to have been written by at least two hands, if not more. And the problems continue, problems continue, and problems will continue even in the rebuttal when I come back. Thank you very much for listening to me. Wa akhiru da'wana, and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Since Bruce Metzger was just read in your hearing, let me read to you a quote from Bruce Metzger, who did the studies, looked at the information that Adnan was just talking about, and then he was asked, has your study of the manuscripts of the New Testament weakened or strengthened your faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ and your faith in Christ? And he said, oh, 
It has increased the basis of my personal faith to see the firmness with which these materials have come down to us, with a multiplicity of copies, some of which are very, very ancient. I've asked questions all my life. I've dug into the text. I've studied this thoroughly, and today I know with confidence that my trust in Jesus has been well-placed, very well-placed. So you have Adnan's interpretation of Bruce Metzger, and you have Bruce Metzger's interpretation of Bruce Metzger. I'm going to go with Bruce Metzger's interpretation of Bruce Metzger. <laughs> I hope you just heard the wildly radical position that was just taken. I submit to you that Adnan will not take that position in regards to the Quran. You don't have the originals of the Quran. You don't have the originals of the New Testament, so we don't know what it says. You don't have the originals of the Quran either. Do you know what it says? Yeah. Oh, how do you, how do you get away with that? We need to apply the same standards. It was said, for example, that because I pointed out, and this is, this is basic scholarship, folks. This is, this is what Metzger says. This is what Ehrman says. This is what Allen says. This is what I've taught when I've taught these subjects in the past. It's basic, simple scholarship that the more copies you have of an ancient work, the better. The fewer you have, the worse. The more you have, the better. That was called the biggest blunder of my presentation. That's an amazing, you're, you're telling me it's good to have all these people making all these additions. Actually, even, let me uh, grab my computer real quick and read you Bart Ehrman. He's no friend of a fundamentalist. Later scribes who were producing our manuscripts, on the other hand, were principally interested in copying the text before them. They, for the most part, did not see themselves as authors who were writing new books. They were scribes reproducing the old books. The changes they made, at least the intentional ones, were no doubt seen as improvements to the text, possibly made because the scribes were convinced that the copyists before them had themselves mistakenly altered the words of the text. For the most part, their intention was to conserve the tradition, not to change it. And so you see, this idea that, well, there's just this massive amount of difference why didn't we have any examples put up there on the screen of these massive amounts of difference? Who, in fact, showed you? He said, I'm trying to suppress uh, the, the, the big problem, that there's textual variance. Who told you about the 400,000? Who showed you the variant of 1 John 3, 1 between Claythoman and Chiasman? That was me. Don't, don't accuse me of trying to suppress something that I've lectured on and talked about for most of my adult life. I'm not suppressing anything. I'm trying to explain to you that that is the byproduct of the best way of preserving the text. What we've had here is a radical attack on the most documented, earliest attested manuscript. Yes, 94% come from that far longer. But do you remember the graphic? No work of antiquity has any witnesses any earlier than the New Testament. None. So to say, oh, well, there's 150 years between when, when Paul wrote in our first manuscript copy or when Mark wrote in our first manuscript copy, that is minuscule in comparison to any other work of antiquity that no one questions the accuracy of our copies of. Minuscule compared to, it's ridiculous. I asked Bart Ehrman, I said, you said that's a large amount of time. What would you consider the amount of time uh, between the, first, the writing and the first copies of Pliny or Tacitus or something like that? And he said, ginormous. He even laughed. Even he recognizes this. So folks, you need to recognize that what has just been said here is basically God couldn't have given us revelation until 1949. You know what happened in 1949? Somebody invented the photocopier. So if there's going to be any changes, if there's going to be any variations, and folks, every work of antiquity, every work, including the Quran, has variance in it, if you're going to make that type of assertion, then there can be no revelation prior to the coming of the photocopier, so that you can make sure to plunk it down, make photocopies. I don't know about you, but I've had some pretty bad photocopiers in my past, and I, sometimes I couldn't read what was photocopied on that either. So uh, who knows? Maybe until modern scanners or something. I don't know. But that kind of standard is not what scholars use to determine the accuracy of something that has been transmitted to us over time. Now, I'm not going to get into all sorts of issues that have almost nothing to do with our debate this evening. If he wants to debate about um, uh, the fact that even Second Peter mentions who the scribe was that wrote it, and that explains the stylistic differences, if he wants to debate canon issues and things like that, uh, I'm not even going to get into the issues of, of uh, you know, more surahs and less surahs in regards to the Quran when we get into that. If he wants to get in that stuff, we can definitely address all those things and have done so. There's a brand new book out, uh, Dr. Kruger at Reformed Theological Seminary in uh, 
uh, has just put out an excellent work on the canon of scripture, very thoroughly documented in depth, and it's written by someone who actually believes God speaks. Most of Adnan's sources are from people who don't believe God speaks. My Muslim friends, why do you quote them? Why do you quote scholars who begin with the assumption, God is mute, he can't talk anymore? Because they don't think he talked in the Quran either. Why are you quoting them? Why the different standards? I don't understand it. I don't have to do that when I analyze your stuff. Why are you doing that to me? I said, oh, they are Christians. Well, you know, I keep pointing out to folks, do you believe that someone who doesn't believe Muhammad was a prophet is a Muslim? Even if they claim to be one, are they a Muslim? I don't think so. So if someone doesn't believe that Jesus Christ was divine and rose from the dead, are they really a Christian? Just because they use the name? I mean, seriously. Let, I, I think we really, really need to. Where is the original? We have no originals at all. We have no originals in the Quran. We have no originals from the ancient world. Scholarship does not say we can't know because we have no originals. Scholarship recognizes that the manuscript tradition is what we rely upon. Anybody ever read Tacitus, Pliny, any of the Greek historians? Those books were copied long after their originals. Do we just simply dismiss them? If we do, we don't know anything that happened in the ancient world. Everything you think you knew was going on back then, you don't actually know it, evidently, given what we've been told this evening. I also point out something else. The Quran is much younger than the New Testament. It had 600 years less time to be transmitted by hand than the New Testament did. And the Old Testament is much older. So we have to recognize that. Honest scholarship would require us to recognize the differences between our texts if, as I said, our goal this evening is to honestly approach each other's texts and to handle these things the way that they need to be handled. We are told that every manuscript differs from every other one. Does that mean we don't know what the original said? No, that's not the case. The differences are minor, they're tiny. There would be like my, my passing out something here at the front row and having you all copy it all the way to the back. Would we be able to figure out at the back what was written at the front? As long as the people along the way were trying to make a copy, yes, we could. And that's exactly what the scribes were doing. The idea that because there's one variant, okay, if, if because there's one variant, we don't know what the original was, keep that standard in mind for the next debate. Because once I show one variant in the Quran, and Islamic scholars recognize this and admit it, then it's all over with, isn't it? I reject the idea that because there is one variant in a manuscript, that means you can no longer know what the original was. There are misprintings in any book today. I've found misprintings in my own book. Does that mean I didn't write the book? Of course not. Keep, keep, just keep these, these, these in mind. Uh, for example, uh, it was also mentioned variants that were introduced intentionally. And the reference that was being read was in, in regards to Luke chapter 2. There were later scribes who were concerned about the fact that Joseph was called uh, his father at a later point. Well, he grew up in Joseph's house. What else are you going to call him? Bob? I mean, so a later punctilious scribe was like, oh, someone might misunderstand, so I won't put father here. I'll put uh, parents or something other than that. Okay, if we, only ha if we only had a controlled transmission of the text, we wouldn't know that was a change. You know why Adnan knows there was a change there? Because we have a freely transmitted text, which means we have earlier manuscripts, which means we can detect those things. And aren't we glad we have them? You see, he has, the, he has the UBS fourth edition corrected there, and he looks down at the bottom of the page, and there's all these notes. He says, editors tell you what's in your Bible. No, I can look at all his notes and tell you what's in all the manuscripts, too. That's all available online. We don't hide it. Those editors are not the ones finally deciding what the Word of God is. Those editors are using the wealth of material that God has given to us to help us to determine what John and Paul and Peter wrote and what they transmitted to us in the gospel. Thank you very much.
Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I told you he's a good speaker. He is a good speaker, absolutely, absolutely. Now, <laughs> now, look at this particular collection of what the editors think is the New Testament. On page three of the introduction of this very fourth edition of the Greek New Testament, constructed by a number of editors, they state, and I quote, on the basis of generally accepted principles of textual analysis, the committee took into account the widest possible range of manuscript readings as well as all internal considerations concerning the origin and transmission of the text. But since in a number of instances, the evidence from such sources points to the possibility of different solutions and thus involves different degree, degrees of certainty with respect to the form of the original text, the letter A, B, C, or D has been employed within braces at the beginning of each apparatus item so as to mark one of four levels of certainty as representing in large measures the difficulties encountered by a committee in making textual decisions. The letter A indicates that the text is certain. The letter B indicates that the text is almost certain. The letter C, however, indicates that the committee had difficulty in deciding which variant to place in the text. The letter D, which occurs only rarely, indicates that the committee had great difficulty in arriving at a decision. This is what the reality is. They are doing their best to construct what may have been written by Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. They do not know what was written by them. They can never know. My claim is we cannot possibly, we cannot possibly construct what was originally penned by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the rest. It is impossible for us to know what they wrote unless a copy signed by Mark was found somewhere buried in Jerusalem or Galilee or wherever he wrote. Until that happens, we cannot be certain. And even if that happens, how do we know it was actually signed by Mark? How do we know who was Mark? How can we even know that? Because you see, the biblical testimony and authority relies on one person, for example, for the Gospel of Mark. Who is Mark? We don't know. How he lived, where he lived, and how he wrote, where he wrote, and who he wrote for. We don't have these details. One person somewhere writing in the middle of nowhere, we don't know who he is. But when we come to the Quran, and I am happy to apply the same criteria to the Quran. You see, when it will come to the Quran, you will see a change in the tone of James White. He will take his gloves off. The gloves off. Ruthless, you know, approach will come out and you will see how the standard changes. <laughs> but, but stay put, stay put. Now, this, this doesn't help James White. This doesn't help him. You flick through the pages, you will see the text is there which is constructed by editors, not by the original authors. And the apparatus is full of variant readings full of thousands upon thousands. And James is saying that we know what is the variant reading. We know. But my question is, which one was written by Mark, Luke, and John? How do we know which was written? Which? There are hundreds of thousands of words attributed to them. How do we know? The New Testament was definitely not transmitted reliably from its alleged authors. Now to my classical um, pre presentation. Here we have some specific examples of corruptions made in the Bible intentionally. These are intentional corruptions, changes made by scribes uh, through the ages. Some beautiful faces always ask us this question. Ask, ask us this, the, this question: When was it corrupted? Who corrupted it? And why? One of them is my dear friend Jay Smith. Isn't he beautiful? <laughs> and some books are written on this topic. Put Ehrman aside, if James doesn't like him, which is very, very clear and evident that James doesn't like Bart Ehrman, we can put him aside and we can concentrate on Bruce Metzger, whom he quoted. What he says about his conviction and faith is not relevant to the, uh, to the case here. What is relevant is what he said about the construction of the New Testament. And he said it was, it was constructed by editors, not by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That tells us clearly that the text of the New Testament was changed. So now the questions are, 
who tampered with the Bible, why did they make these changes, and when. The facts are, as already clearly stated in some of the quotes I had uh, um, read in your presence, that not one sentence is wholly uniform in the manuscript tradition. These changes were made, some intentionally, some by error. Okay, why were intentional changes made? Changes invo involving spelling and grammar, correcting them. Harmonistic corruptions, people were trying to hom harmonize one verse with another. Addition of na natural complements and similar uh, adjuncts. Then clearing of historical and ge geographical difficulties, as we will see in due course, conflation of readings, alterations made because of the, uh, doctrinal considerations, addition of miscellaneous details. Okay. Now, in the third century, the third century, origin, an early church father, he noticed massive number of variant readings, differences in the manuscripts. And he stated, I quote, the differences among the manuscripts have become great, either through the negligence of some copyists or through the perverse audacity of others. They either neglect to check over what they have transcribed or in the process of checking, they make additions or deletions as they please. Origin in the third century. This was already taking place when Origen was looking at his copies. So Codex Sinaiticus is a classical example of some of the changes. Uh, this particular document is the earliest complete copy of the New Testament, and it's from the mid-fourth century. And this doc document in itself has 12,000 corrections. 12,000 corrections made by at least four hands in different times and places. Why, when, how, we don't know. But they were made. Corrections were made. And this particular collection has two extra books which cannot be found in the New Testament of James White, Epistle of Barnabas and Shepherd of Hermas. Why these two books were thrown out and when they were put in, we don't know. Then the ending of Mark. James asserted that no intentional changes were made reading Ehrman. I don't know whether that's what he meant. But I understood it that way, that Ehrman woman was trying to claim that intentional, that scribes didn't intend to change the, the Bible. Most of these errors were unintentional. But here we have the longer ending of Mark in Codex Washingtonicis. And when we go to the next um, manuscripts, the earlier ones, Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus, we do not have the longer end of the Gospel of Mark. Chapter 16, verse 9 to 20 is missing. And biblical scholars, even the conservative biblical scholars, those we regard as fundamentalists, accept that this wasn't originally written by Mark. This was not originally, this passage, this portion wasn't written by Mark. My question is, why is it still in your Bible? Why do you still read it as the word Mark and by extension the word of God? Then we have some manuscripts with different endings. No ending, long ending with the uh, um, intro, some other comment, only the short ending, only the long ending, expanded long ending, first short, then long ending in different manuscripts. So who's doing all of this? Who is playing around with the word of God in different places, in different times? Multifocality, as James White puts it. This is what multifocality does to the scripture and to the word of God. Then a famous corruption in the text of the Bible, 1 John 5, 7. It does not exist anywhere in the early Greek manuscripts, and I'm not going to spend much time on this. Famous story of the adulteress taken in the act, and she was brought to Jesus Christ to be stoned. And we know the story. This story, guess what, ladies and gentlemen, doesn't exist in any of the early Greek manuscripts up to the 9th century. Thank you. This story, which has theological as well as doctrinal significance does not exist in any of the early manuscripts. It was corrupt, it was changed, or it was added into the text by someone who decided to put it in. Was the New Testament reliably transmitted? This is the question. Was it reliably transmitted from its alleged authors? This is the question I'm, I'm addressing today. And it is evident, ladies and gentlemen, that it was not, definitely not, considering all these facts which have been put in front of you today. And the same story is missing from Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, which can be found in the Bible, which James reads today. My question is, James, you know this wasn't, wasn't written by John. Why do you still read it as the word of God in your Bible? Why do you not come out and be brave enough to tell the Christians that this is not the word of God? Hence, 
the Bible was not reliably transmitted from its alleged authors. Thank you very much for listening. All right, so we're ready to start over again? Okay, let's, uh, my, my first minute. I wish Adnan had, had made all those presentations in his opening statement so I'd have a chance to rebut them. You're actually not supposed to do new material in your, in your rebuttal, but that's what happened. Uh, every single reference he brought up, uh, I have written about in, in my book, King, The King James Only Controversy. Um, why not be brave enough to tell people? I've been lecturing on this stuff for years. I've done debates on this stuff. Uh, part of my debate with Bart Ehrman uh, mentioned uh, John chapter 7, verse 53 through 811, and the Pericope Adultery. And I gave all the information on when it was first found, everything. Uh, I've been falsely accused of suppressing, falsely accused of not having the bravery of standing up and doing what I've been doing for decades. Uh, so I would uh, direct um, Adnan to my published works where he would discover that actually scholars have been addressing these things for a very long period of time. I simply want to point out that what Adnan has just said was, you have no evidence that I would ever accept because he said, hey, unless you get a signed Gospel of Mark, but even that wouldn't be good enough. Amazing standard. Well, you would have to show me Mark is Mark who, when, how, where. We don't have this information there. You know, we only have speculations written by Christian scholars and they assume all of these things, all of these uh, conclusions are based upon heavy assumptions. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Now? Thank you. So, all of these conclusions are based upon heavy assumptions. You haven't responded to my question uh, with regards to the authorship of John. You will struggle, you know James, to answer that question. The most authoritative sources here, I have one of them, uh, James may turn around and say this is a liberal source. Well, I, I, would like to, uh, I would like James to abstain from ad hominems and address the points and arguments raised in this particular source, the New Jerome Biblical Commentary. Some of the biggest authorities in the Christian world have contributed to this, and they are telling us as to what the debate is about the authorship of John. We don't even know who these people are. Louder. And thank you. Is it my turn? Or uh, no, it's my turn. Uh, of course, I would love to address a lot of these issues. It'd be, it would be nice to, to debate uh, these issues, uh, especially in regards to canon, canon. I'd love to debate anyone who would like to try to prove that the prologue of John is a later edition. Show me a single manuscript. It's easy, folks, to come up with liberal theories about redaction criticism, because you don't have to come up with any evidence. Very difficult to debate those things. Uh, there is a, a, a film just uh, aired here in England about uh, the Quran and these origins of Muhammad and things like that. And most of you Muslims are going, hey, how about, some, how about some actual evidence? How about some citations from the Quran? I'm saying to you, show me a manuscript that does not have the prologue of John. He just said the prologue of John uh, is a later redaction. Show me a single manuscript that does not have the prologue of John in it. It's a theory, and nothing more than a theory based upon stylistic inferences that does not make it sound in any way, shape, or form. You wouldn't accept it if I did that to you. First of all, James, uh, you have to show me an early manuscript of John so that I can show you what I'm talking about. You don't have it, so it helps me, not you, this, this uh, point you're raising. You don't have a manuscript of the Gospel of John. You have one small fragment as big as a credit card, chapter 18 of the Gospel of John, and we don't have the prologue, so how can I show you? We don't have the manuscript. The point here is, uh, we have manuscripts of John showing that the story of uh, the adulteress doesn't exist. Why don't you throw it out of the Bible? Why don't you tell, you have? Yes. Well, have, you, have you told the church that they should throw it out? Yes. Why is it still in there? It's not in the critical edition of the text there. No. Uh, we're not so supposed why to be interacting. We're not supposed to be interacting. Okay. But why is, it in, why is it still in the English Bible? Pick up a Bible, this is a church. Pick up a Bible and you will find the story in there. Why? When the scholars like James White, respected scholars, know that this passage is not the word of John, let alone the word of God, why is it still in the Bible? If anyone has a modern translation of the Bible, if you'll turn to John chapter 7, verse 53, what do you have in the bottom? You have a footnote telling you that this does not appear in the earliest manuscripts of the Gospel of John, don't you? You all do. Look at the ESV. Look at the NASB. It's there. It's not hidden. We're not hiding anything. 
I have said many, I've been asked many times in public places, well, if I was preaching through the Gospel of John, would I preach John 7, 53 through 8, 11 as scripture? And my consistent answer has been, I would not. I would explain why not. I would explain the background. But everybody in my church knows everything about the Pericope adultery and the longer ending of Mark. I can guarantee you that. They're stuck with me and they know all about it. So again, he says, well, I can't answer that question until you show me the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is the earliest attested book of antiquity. Do you hear the radical nature of this? No work of antiquity would pass Adnan's test. Nothing. We know nothing about antiquity. Now, we have a book from late antiquity, the Quran, which uh, the scholars do agree that it comes from the period uh, called the late antiquity period and the Quran will be scrutinized in due course in the next debate and we will see whether my criteria actually does support the Quran or the Quran actually stands up to that scrutiny we will see that and I'll apply the same criteria my question to you now is how can you now construct what was allegedly written by some people unknown people anonymous people in the first and the early second century uh, and how can you even Think about an original. How can we construct what they wrote? Can we, can we ever with certainty construct what was originally actually written by them? There's absolutely no question that we can do so. I just quoted you Bruce Metzger. I've quoted you Kurt Allen. It just doesn't seem that, that, that Adnan understands the practice of textual criticism, the transmission of ancient documents. It just, it just, I don't know how much more clearly I can attempt to express the fact that if you take the most differing manuscripts we have, even of the Gospel of John, you do not have a different message in the one than the other. If you apply the same rules of interpretation, you're going to get the same message. And when you say, well, we don't have any of these early manuscripts, yes, we do. We have entire Gospel manuscripts closer to the time of their writing than any other work of antiquity. And so the standards being used here is, again, a, a standard that is beyond scholarship. It is not anything that anyone accepts as being scholarly. To say that you have to have a signed manuscript, and even that's not enough. What do we need? A DNA sample? <laughs> somebody wrote Mark, didn't they? Well, somebody wrote Mark, but who is Mark, and where did you write it? <laughs> First of all, you have to tell me who Mark is. Where is he? Where did he write? What language did he use? Greek. Greek. Okay. This, that's an assumption again. You see, I'm, I will read again for James to pay attention from this Greek New Testament. They have given four categories. A, B, C, D. A, the most certain category. B, less than that. C, less than that. And D is uncertain. Now, how can you have A, B, C for the Word of God? How can you have that? How can you have higher level of certainty for the Word of God and then a B category for the Word of God of certainty and then the C and then the D which is obnoxious. Okay? Now the point is how can we possibly construct what was actually written by if Mark ever existed by a man called Mark? The fact of the matter is, what you have at the bottom of those pages is a rich treasure trove of information that Christians are very open about in discussing, and some textual variants are harder to uh, uh, work through than others. That's all that rating system is about. You still have all the witnesses right there at the bottom of the page. Nothing is being hidden from you. You have the opportunity. I have the opportunity of examining those things. We're open about it because of the free transmission of our text. Would anyone in the audience please hold up the critical edition of the Quran that has the same information? There is no such thing. So you're stuck with what your editors told you, and they don't tell you what sources they used. That's what we're going to find out in the second debate. That's the difference, folks. I want to have the information right there in front of me. I want to know what the sources are so I can check those editors. And I frequently do. And when I preach, you can listen to my preaching. I bring those issues up. First of all, are you finished? Sorry. Okay. First of all, such an edition of the Quran wouldn't help your case because that wouldn't help you prove that the Bible was not reliably or was reliably transmitted from the alleged authors. Even if such an edition existed from the Quran or of the Quran. Okay. Secondly, we don't need an edition of the Quran because the Quranic transmission was fully, completely, 100% controlled. 
That's why we have more confidence in it. That's why we know exactly what came from the Prophet and who transmitted it and who these people were. Who was Uthman, Zayd bin Thabit, Abdullah bin Zubair, Ubay bin Kaab, Ali bin Abi Talib, Abu Bakr, Umar, and the, 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 the list goes on. Okay? We know exactly who these people are. Do you know who John is, the one who wrote the gospel? No, you don't. <laughs> First of all, let me thank you all for being here for this first debate. We have one more to go, so don't, uh, don't wander off. I think the second debate will illustrate really what's been going on in the first debate. We have here the historical understanding of how we understand the transmission of ancient texts. That's what I've presented to you. And that's what's used in analyzing classical texts. That's what's used in analyzing the New Testament. Uh, that's how we do scholarship, and that's how we determine that's how we'd be very careful to know what was originally written, not what our religious tradition tells us should have been originally written. That's what we do when we do textual critical scholarship. On Adnan's side, you have an absolutely unscholarly and unreasonable standard that no one, not even the most radical skeptics adopts, that you would have to have a notary public in a time machine that could go back and notarize the Gospel of Mark and then take a DNA sample from Mark and photographs before you'd accept it to be from Mark. You have nothing like that for the Quran, and that's what we're about to see. And so you have two completely different scales being used. Now, much of what Adnan has referred to comes from scholarship that has been very thoroughly refuted. But unfortunately, places like, well, over here, the BBC, isn't really big on talking to conservatives about what they believe. Have you noticed that even amongst Muslims? You know, you always get the radical view. You don't necessarily get the conservative view that's really given much, a, much of a, a, you know, an opportunity. And in the United States, we have CNN and MSNBC and things like that. And it's the same thing. And they're always quoting the, the liberals. But we have a lot of our own scholars. I, I think uh, at one point Adnan said, well, we're not fundamentalists. We're true scholars. You know, I, I, I guess the idea being if you really believe God spoke, and you believe the gospel, then you're not really a scholar, I guess. I'm not sure if that was what was being implied, but I hope not. This book would demonstrate otherwise. It's called The Heresy of Orthodoxy, How Contemporary Culture's Fascination with Diversity Has Reshaped Our Understanding of Early Christianity. Michael Kruger, again, a tremendous scholar, edited this. This goes through many of the popular errors that are out there today, some of which we heard this evening. And so for your great benefit, Adnan, I'm going to provide it to you. And may I please say something, may I please say something? Despite how uh, firmly Adnan and I talk, I like Adnan. He looks better than me and his, I wish, <laughs> I wish I had hair like that. That's all I can say. <laughs> Enjoy it while you have it because you never know, you never know. <laughs> I thought I was gonna have it for a long time too, but it didn't work out that way. Two texts, two different ways of transmission. If you do not want to believe that the wide dispersion of the New Testament in its very earliest time leads to a more firm text because we have many more witnesses from some different places and they are telling us the same story, the variations are understandable variations due to copyist errors in the vast majority of instances. If you don't want to believe that, I can't force you to believe that. I am here for people of truth. One of the 99 beautiful names is Al-Haq. And if God is truth, then we as his creatures had better love that truth. And I do. And I have studied this issue, and I have studied it in depth, and I have defended the reliability of the text of the New Testament against the leading scholars in the English-speaking world, Bart Ehrman, John Dominic Crossan, Marcus Borg, men who have written many books on this subject. And I'm simply here to tell you that when you allow the facts to speak for themselves, there is one thing that is absolutely self-evident, that God revealed himself in a special way in Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. His disciples wrote down that gospel. They wrote to the churches, and God has preserved that word for us. We still have what they wrote, despite the persecution, 
despite the deaths, we still have what they wrote. And yes, we are very open about the fact that there are variations, but one of those variations is the original, and we tell you about what all of them are so that you may hear the message of Christ. There is no other work of antiquity that comes even close to that, and that to me is evidence that God has indeed spoken and preserved his word. I cannot force you to believe that. I can simply present it to you and pray that the Spirit of God will bless you this evening. Thank you very much. Bismillah rahman rahim Thank you very much for attending today's debate, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a very warm interaction between myself and James, and I at no point in any way meant to hurt anyone's feelings. I was simply here to address what I perceive to be the truth, and I have done my best to put it as I deem fit. And the reality is, ladies and gentlemen, that the New Testament can never be reconstructed. Even if we were to employ all our faculties, intellectual, material, and philosophical, we simply wouldn't be able to reconstruct what we know today as the New Testament. It is simply the work of man. The text we read today as the New Testament is man-made. There is no doubt about that. Absolutely man-made, made by editors somewhere in the US or in the UK, depending on where they are. And what goes to the apparatus is, we know today, as, uh, are the variant readings. Now, we will never know what was originally written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for reasons already given to you. Now, amazingly, ladies and gentlemen, the question I ask is, how would the Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad, know this? Peace be upon him. The first time the Christians came across this catastrophe in the manuscripts, known as the variant readings, was in the early 18th century. The real extent was known then. In 1707, a scholar called John Mill published a book on the variant readings of the New Testament. And he only studied 100 manuscripts. And he came up with 30,000 variant readings. And he was rebuked, condemned, criticized for that, for doing that. And the Quran, 14 centuries ago, tells us in chapter 2, verse 79, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaitan rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Fawailu li ladhina yaktabun al-kitaba bi-aydihim, thumma yaquluna hadha min indillah, liyahtaru bihi thamanan qalila. Fawailu lahum mimma katabat aydihim, wawailu lahum mimma yaksibun. Woe be unto those who write books with their own hands and say, these books are from God. Little do they earn from these actions. Woe be unto what they write, and woe be unto what they earn. This is what the Quran states. Prophet Muhammad was not a Greek textual uh, New Testament critic. He was not a scholar. He was not a theologian. He never went to an academy. He never went to a school or a university to study the Greek manuscripts or the Hebrew manuscripts and the variant readings therein. Rather, what he received was the revelation. Oh Muhammad, you speak not from yourself, rather you speak from an inspiration. And he was inspired to state what he said. That the book or the books of the people of scripture, the Jews and the Christians have been changed. They have been corrupted and they have lost the original teachings and writings of the, the prophets and those who wrote these books in the later age. They have been lost. And the Quran is absolutely accurate in this regard. Absolutely accurate. The Christian scholars will tell you that. The atheistic scholars will tell you that. And the Jewish scholars will tell you that. Muslims' word in this is not important, I think. The word of the Muslims is not important. Muslims have the Quran to believe in. For us, the Quran is enough. The Quran tells us that their scriptures were changed. This is enough for us. But in order to show you, ladies and gentlemen, Christian, brothers and sisters in humanity, 
we have to bring the Quran in and show you the evidence from your side that the Quran is absolutely accurate. Thank you very much for listening today. May God guide you to the truth wherever it may be. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa alhamdulillah.